This visual display of data lecture is about how graphics can reveal patterns in data and what we can do to reveal those patterns. And this book is listed down here. This is a very influential book um, where some of these examples are taken from. And this is kind of like the Bible of graphic design for people interested in data. Okay, so plotting data can reveal hidden interactions or properties that you may not otherwise see. So in general, when we have data, we want to plot the data. Think about other things to add to the plots, right? Are there other things we can add that might reveal information? Think about other ways to plot the data. Just because we've made one plot doesn't mean that some other plot might not be a better one. And then really what you want to do is once you have data, you spend all this time getting data, you want to make several plots and think about them a lot until you really understand your data. And then once you really understand your data, you might get insight that you would have otherwise not, not gotten. So let's look at some examples. This is from NFL football from the first week of the 2002 season. Um, we're going to imagine that we are trying to figure out what causes a team to be the winner and what causes a team to be the loser. And in each of these plots, the teams on the left are the losing teams. The teams on the right are the winning teams. And in this figure, we've got points scored written on the y-axis. So it kind of looks like you know the losers on general um, had fewer points than the winners. Um, but it's not totally conclusive. We can maybe add some other information. And the information we could add is we each loser is paired up with a particular winner, right? Each loser with a particular winner. So what we can do is draw a little line, say, between each members of the pairs and see what's going on there. And when we do that, we get a pattern that looks like this. It looks like, and if we analyze this, all these slopes are positive. It actually looks like in every single case, the loser had fewer points than the winner. So points seems to be a pretty good kind of factor that's probably determining who wins. Uh, we can also see some other things, like for example, this game here, this is a game that's like seven to 10. What an incredibly boring game this would be. And then these steepest slopes, these are the biggest blowouts, right? This is a 21 to 49 game, right? This is a, looks like a six or seven to 34, 33 game, right? That's a very uneven game. So by adding this information, we've identified some interesting games. Okay, what about offensive yardage? Maybe this is the statistic that's used to determine winners or losers. So in this case, we actually have a very similar pattern where the losers tend to have smaller values than the winners. Let's do the same thing. Now we see that, well, actually we have some cases where there are negative slopes, right? Actually this team here had fewer offensive yards than the team it beat over here. So this offensive yardage statistic is working very differently from points in terms of its relationship between winners and losers. All right, what about this? This is third down success percentage. This is in football. Third down is your second last chance to keep going. Otherwise, if you don't do well here, you basically got to give the other team a chance. Same general looking pattern. Maybe third down success percentage is how we decide who wins and loses. When we connect, we see this. And we can see the same thing where we don't have the consistent positive slopes like we did for points. We can see some very strange things like these this game is probably one of the low scores because they both had very terrible third down conversions. You can see this huge mismatch here, but you can also see there are definitely a couple of cases that are going the other way. And then our final statistic, time of possession. This is um, how much time the team controls the ball. It's a little less clear, but it kind of looks like it increases from left to right. What do we get when we connect them? Oh, we actually get a completely different pattern, right? This is a different pattern, and this is because now that we think about it, if there's 60 minutes in a game, that means this team, if they had it for 38 minutes, that means the other team is going to have it for 22 minutes, which now that we think about it makes sense. But if you make this figure, you can tell just from looking at it that this statistic is acting very differently from the previous two. And if you actually take out this one game here, you can see that in general, it looks like there's this increase. So we've actually identified this very, very weird game here. And so when I saw this figure, I then decided to figure out what game that was. 
So it turn, turns out that game was the um, New York Jets against the Buffalo Bills. There's a running back for the Bills that ran 31 times for 149 yards. If you're a football fan, you know that's a lot, and that leads to lots of time on the clock. If you're not football, just take my word for it. The Jets did not have very many runs, right? 15 instead of 31. Runs tend to use up lots of time on the clock. But what they did have was two things which are called kickoff returns for touchdowns. So you score points and essentially take no time off the clock. These are very rare. And in fact, to have two in the same game is incredibly unusual. And so I discovered this game, this unusual game that had two kickoff returns in the same game, something's almost never done. And it jumps out because we added this data to this figure, identified this very unusual game, and then followed up in more detail to discover this really interesting um, thing that happened. So the same sort of thing can happen with biological data, right? You make one plot, maybe make a plot that looks like this. Add some information, and maybe that information shows you something really interesting to follow up on. Here's a equation from ecology. So don't worry about the details of this equation. This is not going to be an exam or anything. Um, if you have had ecology, you'll recognize it if you haven't. Um, what this is, is it's an equation for logistic population growth. So the idea is the change in the population size over a certain amount of time is given by this equation, which has a growth rate, the previous population size, and a carrying capacity. And basically, if you think about it, when the population is larger than the carrying capacity, this term will be negative. The change in the population is negative, so the population comes back down. If the population is less than the carrying capacity, this term will be positive. The growth rate is positive, so the population goes up. So now it turns out for very large values of R, this growth rate here, the population behavior becomes something called chaotic it appears to fluctuate wildly and to the eye unpredictably. So if you have a large enough growth rate, you can get what's called chaotic population growth. So here's an example. One of these plots, this is population over time, one of these plots shows chaotic population growth, right? When it's above the carrying capacity, it'll come back down. When it's below the carrying capacity, it'll go up. Um, and that's deterministic, right? It comes from that equation on the previous slide. The other is what's called a stochastic model. That's a model that has randomness in it. So the population size is kind of changed randomly. And if we look at these two figures, though, it's not immediately obvious which is which, right? Just by the naked eye, we wouldn't have a whole lot of confidence about which is the random one and which is the chaotic one. But the figures have all the data we need to figure this out. What we can actually do is go to each of these figures and plot the next population versus the previous population. The previous slide showed that there was an equation, right? If you plug in the population, plug in the carrying capacity, you can predict the next population perfectly. If it's a stochastic process, you're not going to be able to make that prediction. So we can go to these figures, use all the information that's already in them to make a new figure, and we would get like this. And here you can actually see, right, there's basically no relationship between the current population and the next one. But over here, there's a very clear relationship between the current population and the next one. So this is the stochastic model. Basically, it's being randomly changed around 100. This is the chaotic model, where if it's below, it uses that equation to go back up. Once it gets above, it goes back down in this very organized predictable and deterministic pattern. So again, to the naked eye, we might not really feel confident at all about which is the chaotic and which is the stochastic one. But when we use the exact same information that we already had in the plot and just looked at it in a different way, then it becomes very obvious which is the chaotic and which is the stochastic process. This is an example figure from um, a master's thesis from a few years ago. This is a student who had tracked fish uh, around the harbor. They put trackers on them and you can see like over a certain period of time they had followed them. They're tracking the ship. And here's the statistics of the fish. This is the gender of the fish, the sex, the female or male. This is the size of the fish, right, in uh, centimeters or whatever it was. Um, 
the tracking begins here and goes there, and that's the last time the signal is achieved. So, so this figure is basically showing how long are they seeing these fish within a certain region. But if we think about it, this could be there, there could be a way to make this better, right? Like the females and males are all mixed up. It might be good to like have the females at the bottom and the males at the top and see if the pattern looks different for males and females. Maybe females stay longer, males stay less, um, and that would become obvious. Or maybe the size of the fish has something, right? We could order it from smallest down to largest and see then when this gets reshuffled, maybe larger fish stay longer and smaller fish stay less or whatever. Um, or maybe there's a more clear pattern for um, when it starts, right? So we could order these things again, like the very first one at the bottom, the second one, second, and then progress like that and see it more clearly if when it starts influences how long it stays. So these are three different things that we could look for a relationship in if we rearrange these. But the way that the figure was actually represented, it doesn't do any of those. So I actually asked the student, like, okay, so why did you choose that particular arrangement? And they basically said that's what R spit out, which is not the right answer, right? There's extra information. The student spent, this is over a year, on a boat tracking fish to get a bunch of data and there's potentially a lot more interesting data in this figure that the student can get for free just by making a slightly different representation of the figure.